Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, this is a little different tonight than what we've been doing previously and also different than what we had planned. Uh, we, uh, in the past uh, little bit of time while COVID's been going on, we've been using go to meeting. Uh, but it's been hard for some people to log in. We've had some issues with that. So we decided uh, as plan B uh, to do a live stream on Facebook and to do that. We started this evening with a live stream attempt. Uh, it didn't work. We had some technical difficulties. Things just did not work. So now we've gone to plan C, which is to record this lesson. Uh, and then uh, Rory is, is, is going to post it for us. And that way you're still able to get your Wednesday night lesson, though you may watch it at some point later than Wednesday night. Uh, last week, we started a three-part series on God's image, the image of God. Uh, because as I, as I said last week in our go-to meeting, I've heard a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching on the creation account, that we are created in God's image and His likeness. But I haven't heard a lot of preaching and teaching that just doesn't mention it without really explaining it. They don't really talk that much about it. And some of the preaching and teaching that I've heard has been erroneous. Um, I've heard people say, well, we are created in God's image and likeness because God is a trinity and we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. The problem with that, while I agree that God's a trinity and I agree that we are body, soul, and spirit, and I don't have a problem with that, that's not what the text says. And so I decided in my personal study, I wanted to do a survey, biblically, of what it means to be in the image of God. Uh, what does that phrase really mean and how does it apply to me today as a follower of Christ? So I'm just, I'm just uh, refreshing a little bit of our memory from last week. This is part two, so I want to refresh our memory of last week. Last week, our primary scripture was Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make man or human beings in our own image, in our likeness. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. He explains what being in the image of God, the likeness of God really is. Likeness of God means like God. We are like him. Well, we're not gods. He didn't make us as little gods, but we're like God. How are we like God or in his image? He tells us so that... They, meaning us, rule. That's what God does. God rules the entire universe. People say, well, there are more, you know, that there are more universes out there. How many ever universes there are, he rules them all. He is the ruler of everything. So he tells us, so that they, meaning us, man, human beings, we can rule. What do we rule? We rule the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. He has made us, in a sense, caretakers of his planet. The planet still belongs to him, but we are made in his image, in his likeness, as rulers over the planet. And I even got into a little bit of a digression last week. I don't know that we've done a terrific job with our planet. We can talk all about that later. Uh, that's last week's lesson. However... Coming to this week, part two, acknowledging that God created us in his image, in his likeness, as rulers of the planet, which is exactly what the text says, and I believe in keeping everything textually correct. Ladies and gentlemen, I've also realized something else in this study. Sin distorts the image of God. Sin distorts it. It changes it. Now, I'm going to start off with this question. How many of you have, have ever really been hurt, hurt by somebody? Maybe not physically. I'm talking about somebody you've trusted, depended upon, who has hurt you immensely. Now I'm going to go to the next step. How many of you have had that situation happen in the church? Where it's, you know, in the world, on your job or whatever, you may expect that stuff to happen because you're dealing with sinners uh, who are not saved by grace. But when you're in the church, you expect people to be saved by grace through faith, followers of Christ, disciples of our Lord. What happens when they hurt you in the church? 
Why does it hurt so much more when it's in the church? Because I'm going to tell you, the deepest wounds I've ever felt in my personality and my spirit have not happened in the world on my job. I mean, I teach school. I've been cussed out by students. I've been cussed out by teachers. I had a principal scream at me one time. That didn't hurt me. I mean, it bothered me, but it didn't hurt me. But I've had a few people in the church who'd never even raised their voice who hurt me so deeply that, I mean, I had tears coming down my face that hurt so bad. Why is it that such a hurt in the church is so much deeper? It's because we expect the people in the church to be in the image of God after his likeness. We have a certain belief system about what it means to be a Christian. Uh, but sin distorts the image. So what we expect from that Christian, someone who's not going to hurt us, someone, someone we're able to depend on, when sin distorts the image, we get hurt. That's exactly what happens. Notice how the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis continues. God created man in his image. God created man in his likeness to rule the planet, the Bible says, pretty much. Rich Roberts paraphrase. But Adam and Eve sinned. Sin distorts the image of God. They ate of the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The one thing God told them not to do. The serpent tempted. Eve took the fruit. Eve gave it to her husband who recognized what the fruit was. Don't be blaming Eve for everything. Adam did it too. They ate the fruit and sin entered their lives. They experienced shame for the first time. They tried to hide from God because they realized that they were naked. So what happens here? This is important. This is, this is a scripture a lot of preachers miss because it goes back to this rulership of the planet. It's Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. You need to look at this very carefully. God comes down. He talks with them. He confronts them with their sin. Then God starts handing out punishments. There's an interesting punishment that God hands down that's not on the serpent. That's not on Adam and Eve. It's a, it, it's a curse on creation itself. Notice what the Bible says, Genesis 3, 17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Did you catch that phrase, because of you? Remember, Adam and Eve are created in his likeness. Adam and Eve are created in his image. But they have allowed that image to become distorted. So God says, because of you, the ground is now cursed. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Ladies and gentlemen, ruling the planet got a lot harder. It was paradise before. There was no curse. What happens? When sin distorted the image of God in Adam and Eve, when sin distorted the likeness of God that was in them, a curse comes about that basically says, you're going to try to rule this planet. This planet's going to give you a hard time and you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. Those of us who have jobs, by the way, that work by the sweat of our brow, we may want to confront Adam about that a little bit later and, you know, we know whatever Whenever we get to heaven, assuming he's there, uh, we may have something to say to him about all of that. The women who've had pain in childbirth, you may want to talk to Eve about that one. Uh, but all, <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, all of this is due to the curse. Sin distorted the image of God, and because of that, a curse comes about. Even in this, ladies and gentlemen, God had a plan. A plan to take care of the curse. Genesis 3.15, the Bible says... Uh, he, he, was, he, uh, he was speaking to the serpent. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. Those of you who study your scripture, you know this is a prophecy of Christ. Uh, Christ crushes the head of the serpent. He crushes. He destroys sin. The, uh, sin, the, you know, the serpent may bruise his heel, which is a picture of the crucifixion. But 
Ultimately, Christ is the victor. At the cross, Jesus used that wonderful word to telestai. And it, and, it, and it comes out translated as it is finished. And when he said it is finished, that is when the gavel goes down, grace is applied, and our redemption is sealed. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the image of God restored. Sin distorts the image, but Jesus is the restoration of that image. There are two scriptures tonight that we're going to look at very carefully, and I want you to have your Bibles. The first one is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And I'll go ahead and preview for you the second one that we're going to look at a little bit later is Romans 5, 12 to 21. That's the second verse we're going to look, second set of verses. But right now I want us to focus on Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. This is what the Bible says. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Stop there. We're talking about the image of God. So now, now you're able to see why this applies. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, for he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now I could spend the next three, four, five weeks just on that one set of verses. There's a lot of stuff here and I'm not going to be able to unpack it all tonight. Uh, I mean, this is this, you could have a sermon series right here. This is awesome stuff, you know, studying this. However, for our purposes tonight, Paul tells us that Jesus is not just made in the image of God the way Adam and Eve were. He's not just made in the image of God. He is the image of God. Do you see the difference? Jesus is not made in his image. Jesus is his image. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we were made to be similar to God in his image, in his likeness, like him. Jesus is God himself. Who has been re-imaged for us so, so that we can understand what it means to be in the image of God. When we look at Jesus, we see what humanity was always supposed to be. If humanity was created to be like God, Jesus was God made to be like humans. Think about that very carefully. If humanity was created to be like God, Jesus was God made to be like humans. 100% God, 100% man. We were always supposed to be like God. If Adam and Eve had not fallen, it would have been a whole different story of human history. We would never have had to deal with the issues of sin. It would have been paradise on the entire earth. You would never have had to have Jesus dying on a cross. We would not have had to try to recapture what it means to be in his image because we would be in his image. But sin distorts the image. In the account of God creating humanity, which he looked, you know, which we looked at last week, the writer of Genesis emphasized the authority that human beings were given as image bearers. We were given authority over the entire planet. Here in Colossians, Paul makes it clear that Jesus' authority goes back even before creation. Because the Bible says in Colossians 1.16, in him all things were created. We were made in his image, in his likeness, to be in, you know, in that image. He is the image because all things were created in and for him. Jesus was the image of God before we were made in his image. Jesus was already his image. Our authority over the fish and the sea and so on uh, is delegated from Jesus' greater authority because he has authority over all things in heaven and earth. So we have a delegated authority from him. Paul deals with this problem of our alienation, with this idea of sin distorting the image of God in our lives by reminding us, this is what he says, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death 
to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Colossians 1.22. What has he done? Through his death, he is recreating in us the idea that we are the image of God, that we are in his likeness. That's what salvation's about. When a person gets saved, the Bible says he's a new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away. What are the old things? The old things are that corrupted image of God. The old things are the sinful lifestyle that's trying to bring us down. And all things have become new. What has become new? He's recreating this image of God, this likeness of God inside of us. We, have, we, we, we actually call that by a name. Uh, in our theological studies, it's called sanctification. When he saves us, he justifies us. He makes us, uh, he, he declares us just or righteous. But then he starts to sanctify, to purify. He puts good things in and takes bad things out. And he does this daily, every minute by minute. He's purifying, he's shaping us. He's, you know, we have heard, you know, we have heard that phrase molded in his image. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what's happening. Molded in his image, the image of God that that we were initially created to be, he's restoring that inside of us. What sin has distorted, Jesus has conquered, and Jesus is restoring inside of us what we should have been, he's making us to be. Amen. Now, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want to read verses 12 to 21. And again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I say this. This, this scripture, uh, you, you can do a sermon series in Romans 5. Uh, Brother Larry's preached the book of Romans. Uh, but I mean, you can stay just in chapter 5 and stay a long time here. There's a lot of stuff in this passage of scripture. Romans 5, 12 to 21. I'm probably going to stop make, stop, make a few comments as I'm reading. But then I'll get to the heart of what I want to say. Therefore, Romans 5, 12. Just as sin entered the world through one man... And death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against everyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. As did Adam, who is the pattern of one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be, be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more, I love those phrases, how much more will those who receive God's abundant grace and, I'm sorry, God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all. For just, for just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that trespass might increase. But where sin increased... Grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, that is a rich, rich passage. He deals with this idea of Adam's sin. Death reigned over the planet because of Adam's sin. All right, uh, as I said, sin distorts the image of God. Sin brings about death. We were never supposed to die. We were never supposed to taste death. We were supposed to live forever in the presence of the Lord perfectly in paradise. But sin distorted the image of God and, 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 and because of Adam's sin brings about death and decay. Adam led the human race to this death. 
However, Jesus leads us to life abundant and to wholeness and completeness. Jesus, through the atonement on the cross, brings about a wholeness to us. It's a restoration of this image of God. Now, there's a key verse I want to point out here, and I want you to notice something very carefully because it goes back to what we're talking about. Romans 5, 17. Look at this verse very carefully. For if, by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, here we go, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Did you catch that reign in life? What's the purpose of being made in his image and in his likeness? We are rulers. We go back to Genesis chapter 1. To rule over the planet. What does he say here? If we receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, what happens? We reign in life. Not future, right now. We reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. In other words, the image of God is being restored. The likeness of God is being restored so that we are rulers. We are, we are those reigning over the planet doing what God has called us to do. Is it a perfect system right now? No. Why? Sin is still in the world. Sin is still corrupting. The devil tempts Christians every day just like he tempts everybody else. Sin is still trying to corrupt. Sin is still trying to destroy. But... When we receive, what does this say? God's abundant provision of grace. When we allow God's grace to flow through us, to flow in us, when we allow that grace to become evident and to shine forth as radiant lights to everybody around, what happens? The gift of righteousness reigns in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the image of God, shines through us, who, is, who all of us who are being restored in the image and the likeness of God. And that process, that sanctifying process, continues every day, every moment. So that hopefully, after 42 years of being, being a Christian, some parts of me, I think, are sanctified. That I have devoted to the Lord. Other parts, I'm still, you know, the Lord and I are still working on. But sanctification, I'm, I'm a much more mature Christian now after 42 years, you hope, than what I was when I first got saved at 10 years of age. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens? God has entrusted me. He has entrusted me to take some leadership. He has entrusted me to shine forth his testimony. He has entrusted me to be a representative, an ambassador for him to everyone around me. And what does that mean? I'm reigning in life. Through, not, not, not because of me, but because of one man, Jesus Christ, the Bible says. That, that person, the true image of God, shines in and through my life. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at Jesus as the image of God, I hope today you have come to realize you've been made for a high purpose. Uh, the sin in your life has distorted that purpose. The sin in your life is trying to separate you from that purpose. But if you will allow the grace that God gives to flow through you, if you will allow his abundant life just to shine through to everyone around you, if you'll truly be testimonies and ambassadors that God's called you to be, if you allow the blessings to flow through, ladies and gentlemen, as the Bible says, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? Because you become God's true ambassador and the image is restored in and through you. Jesus Christ shining through you. That's what it's all about. Next week, we will continue with this series. We will conclude this series. We're going to look at part three of this three-part series, uh, which is God's image in mission. God's image in mission. I want to pray with you, and that will conclude our Wednesday night Bible study. Lord, there's a lot of stuff here. And I barely scratched the surface. Lord, I feel like I've, I've been looking at an iceberg and only looking at the top and not realizing what all's below the water. Lord, there's a lot of stuff in this study. But Lord, uh, it, it has truly been enough to entice us to study more, to get to know you more, to get to, to really dig into your word. I pray, Lord, where I have failed as a teacher that you will make up the difference. I pray, Lord, that you will inspire us and exhort us, Lord, just to get to know you more and more. Allow your grace to reform, re-image us into your image. 
I give you honor and praise and glory for this through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.